Hello and welcome to GCV Analytics webinar. This is our first webinar for the new year and for this new decade. Just ahead of our GCV Innovation Summit in Monterey, California next week. So I'm really excited to be doing this annual data review with our founder and editor-in-chief, uh, Jim Mawson. Welcome, Jim. Well, thanks, Kellyanne, and I'm super excited to be here, actually. It feels like the last decade was a fantastic one, and the decade ahead is going to perhaps be even more exciting. And I think one of the things I'm super excited by looking at the data and hearing some of your insights, Kellyanne, is it's just how this top 20% of CBCs have not just survived, but thrived with more than a decade's track record. And I think the unique data that you and others within the team have been collecting in GCV analytics will really show how the corporate back deals across the globe over the past year and the past 10 years, as reviewed in our upcoming World of Corporate Venture in 2020 report, uh, will really be shown and really be indicating, I think, you know, how important corporations have become and I think are starting to set the agenda for the overall innovation capital uh, ecosystem. So, Kalyan, let us let us know what can we expect. All right. Um, so, what we've got on the agenda for today. Um, first, we're going to start uh, talking about some some of the general trends in um, in VC and CVC deals that we've seen. There, we're going to jump um, onto some of the exits that we've seen. Um, some of which exciting, others not as exciting, and perhaps slightly disappointing. Um, <laughs> some of the, then we'll look at the funding initiatives and uh, at the end of the presentation I've prepared uh, a bit of a, a bit of a teaser um, for, for our audience with uh, some some insights from our latest survey that we ran um, the three months uh, up to uh, New Year's Eve. Um, so so let's uh, so, so let's get started um, basically. 2019 was a memorable year for CVCs and for venture capital as a whole. Um, we saw two much awaited IPOs from the right hailing sector, Uber and Lyft. Uh, we saw a big $3 billion acquisition um, by Uber of Kareem, its peer in the Middle East. Uh, and of course, we saw the fallout of, uh, of WeWork. Um, so one might argue and not without merit, that some of these big uh, big transactions and big events um, have been a little disappointing, as I said. And, and like I said, not without merit. Um, Uber's IPO was record-breaking with its uh, $82 uh, billion in market cap, but a far cry from what the syndicate of investment bankers had expected. They were hoping for $120 billion in market cap. Uh, and the company as it's still not generating profits, um, has seen its uh, stock price uh, becoming penalized in public markets uh, ever since, as this graph shows. And the story of Lyft was not really that different in the end, even though um, it did take off on the day of its IPO in a more hopeful way, issuing um, 32 million shares on NASDAQ uh, at, at about $72 per share, having upped the range uh, it set earlier. Um, but its stock price has, has since gone down and it's moving between $40 and $50 per share right now. And of course, uh, we work the uh, probably most talked about and uh, infamous example from, from last year. Um, it's, it's a case of a failed IPO. Um, its valuation took a huge tumble from 47 billion to less than 10 billion, and there had to be a 9.5 billion bailout organized by its main investor, SoftBank. Uh, subsequently, so so while these these notes and these highlights, these three things that we could think off the top of our minds, are somewhat pessimistic. Um, I, I I I I wouldn't say it's it's all it's all that bad. I wouldn't say it's all bad, that bad. And um, you know, if if we look at if we look at how how deals uh, in which CVCs uh, have been involved have evolved over the past decade, uh, we do see some reasons for optimism. The total number of deals um, went up globally on a year-on-year -year basis from. Uh, little over 2,800 in uh, 2018 to over 3,200 in 2019. Um, we did see a drop 
in the total in the total dollars value um, from 168 billion in 20 in 2018 to um, to 134 billion last year. Um, but this was likely due to some challenges of big tech companies in China. So, uh, Jim, would you like to comment briefly on briefly on those uh, those things that have uh, caused this yeah. uh, this sort of drop? Yeah, I think it's fascinating, and certainly if you if you're more in the sort of western part of the world, you know, we work and things like Uber and Lyft really dominate the attention and the, certainly the media attention. But actually, from that global perspective, you know, what's driven you know the increase in sort of value and volume of deals over the past few years has been the sort of U.S. and China and increasingly a globalization of corporate venture capital. So more deals are done in Brazil and Europe and Southeast Asia and even Africa and other countries, Middle East. You know, but I think last year was starting to be perhaps a little bit of an inflection point. What we've seen is an increase in deals happening in the US, but the volume somewhat being more static. But China you know, has seen a sort of near 50, 50 billion drop in the value of deal, corporate deals done there last year and I think we'll see a little bit more in terms of activity later on what that might mean but I think you know the attention on WeWork actually is mass potentially a slightly bigger issue which is what's happening in China and you know it's hard to get to too much of a sense there we do our Asia Congress but we'll come to more on that but I think you know a year to remember last year certainly you know but I think the some of the nuances and some of the data underpinning that you know will uh, you know, will really be more influential of what we can expect in the decade to come. Right, and in terms of uh, in terms of the of, of the WeWork um, fallout, which received that much uh, attention on on the media, uh, what do you think uh, it's going to be? What do you think is going to be its effect on some of the upcoming IPOs, on some of uh, some of the other um, well? So some of the funding initiatives uh, involving corporates and, and, and VCs, uh, what's yes. what's your take on that? Yeah, so I think, you know, if you go back to SoftBank bailing out WeWork, you know, 2016, which is when we started to see that real increase in the value of the deals that corporates were involved in up to that 168 billion high in 2018, mm -hmm. that sort of near doubling in effect in that time period. You know, partly it was down to SoftBank raising 100, nearly 100 billion in 2016 for its first vision fund and going out and saying to entrepreneurs, hey, we can really back you to grow and we can give you high valuations. That created a sort of me too or mimetic desire for other entrepreneurs and they raised more higher valuations. We just reported on a deal today about, you know, a, a relatively small company in India called Zoomcar. You know, last year, just before the WeWork IPO was due to come out, it was looking to raise 500 million at a high valuation. Now it's trying to raise 100 million. It's just closed on 30 million with Sony being part of it. And I think it just shows a recalibration of, you know, expectations for entrepreneurs on the valuations and how much they can raise. But secondly, I think that sort of second order of what other companies might be able to IPO, certainly public market investors, you know, approve they could be skeptical about what the private market have been valuing and expecting. Um, and then the third order sort of uh, of cascade that might come out of WeWork and other things out of SoftBank is can SoftBank raise a second vision fund anywhere near or even more than what it raised for the first vision fund? If it can't, then there's a longer term impact on broadly how much the venture ecosystem could put out. $100 billion over two or three years is a lot of money. You know, and encourages right. others to raise a large amount, you know, and encourages other other sort of high valuations. And I think without that, you know, perhaps you go back more to the sort of 2014, 2015 levels of sort of values of venture deals, but potentially not. If you look last year, there still was a lot of venture deals done. And I think we'll come to more in the future about the number of corporates in particular coming on stream with their own venturing programs and as long as they're not negatively impacted by SoftBank's challenges then I think that will be where the interest in sort of second order uh, fallout from WeWork and SoftBank will lie. If they are affected then we'll see a sort of you know more return towards the mean. If they're not then I think we can still reach newer heights in this decade. 
All right. Um, and if we look at, uh, at the deals on a quarterly basis from last year, uh, we didn't see actually uh, that much uh, drastic of a variation. The deal count rose from uh, 817 deals in Q1 to 873 in uh, Q3, and, uh, and then went down to 711 deals in the fourth quarter. In terms of total value, the total estimated capital in Corporate bag deals went down from uh, 34.8 billion in Q1 to 29.9 billion in the second quarter, and then somewhat plateaued during the third to go back up uh, to uh, 40 billion in the last quarter. But um, we got to be careful with the last quarter because that includes the 9.5 uh, 9.5 billion bailout of, uh, of SoftBank. So, um, hmm. so, so you know. We have to bear in mind that point, that point in the analysis. Um, and you know, as as you said, uh, there's still a lot, a lot of deals going on on a on a global scale, and uh, it's not surprising that we're seeing uh, this many deals because uh, we've just been seeing um, a lot of a lot of uh, corporate entities investing in minority stake deals globally. And as a matter of fact, their number has been growing over the past decade, as this uh, this graph shows. And over the past four or so years, we've seen consistently more than a thousand such investors investing globally. Um, and uh, actually, last year we saw more than 1,800, as uh, as this clearly shows. So, um, if we if we compare them um, to the total VC flow um, that's shown on the red line here, which is uh, data from uh, from our partner's uh, pitch book, um, we see that um, overall venture capital activity globally has somewhat plateaued over the past over the past few years, uh, really. And um, you know, there have been some minor fluctuations, but uh, overall, the number of corporate um, VC deals, uh, which are shown below in the uh, blue line that's uh, our gcb analytics data um we've seen consistently we've seen it consistently stay on its upward trajectory um above 2000 transactions uh, from 2015 onward uh and even surpassing 3200 transactions last year um and this of course has has come hand in hand with uh more with you know participation in in very much uh, higher higher valued companies or companies with deals with uh, higher valuations, as this uh, this chart suggests. So if we if we look at the money percentage wise, the the dollar share of deals with uh, with corporates and syndicates began to grow in uh, twenty in twenty fourteen, really when. Uh, when the total number of, uh, of VC dollars began to rise, going up to 115 billion from uh, 71 billion the previous year, and it sort of reached uh, a peak at 302 billion uh, in 2018, um, and this indubitably suggests that corporate ventures uh, have been increasingly involved in funding rounds of uh, emerging company with much high, with very much high valuations. Um, so that's that's important to keep in mind, uh, given that um, you know their share of the total deals is is still is still is significant, but still within uh, 10 to 15 percent. Um, so so another another big milestone that I'd like to highlight uh, here is that if we take all the numbers uh, on this red line above, which is all the estimated. Uh, amounts of, of capital in, invested in uh, in venture rounds globally we see that over the past decade we we had over 1.37 trillion dollars invested so that's that is a huge amount of money and uh, um, you know pretty much a fact to a fact to kind of uh, ponder on a bit um, so I know Jim you you and I co-wrote uh, a piece um, of well, well, you you wrote uh, you wrote actually a piece uh, on some of the challenges ahead of CBCs in, in in the new decade. So, would you like to tell us briefly briefly about them, and if the new decade that we've got ahead of us still will look like like this one? 
<laughs> yeah, there's a there's an old saying, isn't it, uh, that uh, this time it's different or paradigm shift uh, are the most expensive words in financial uh, the financial mm. lexicon because um, you know the moment you start to think, well, actually that 1.37 trillion dollars is more than all prior decades of venture capital put together, even including right. the dot com bubble period, then you start to kind of just take a take a step back to say why are we seeing that amount of money put out in the 2010s can it continue on will it get more or will it sort of perhaps you know fall back a little bit and i think that's the the big question as we start this decade is you know kind of where are we going if you look just at back in the last year we start to see that slight retrenching in the amount of dollars put out you know and i think you know it's really oh. clear that what drove the 2010s was more strategic investments. You know, mm -hmm. And I think if you go back to why we started Global Corporate Venturing back in 2010, it was because we had a view that coming out of the global financial crisis, we would see um, more strategic investment in the faster growing companies. It became an imperative both for countries as well as companies as well as individuals to think how do they grow their equity value the sort of returns have been driven for the prior 30 years through the debt sort of explosion leading up to the financial crisis you know meant that you had to grow the equity in order to relatively outperform and then, then obviously be able to potentially borrow more at better terms you know as debt became more commoditized so that was effectively the thesis and that thesis you know has really played out in the 2010s so the question is is you know is there still a strategic driver for people to be interested in innovation capital are there any sort of macro factors out there that will basically put you know um you know put a sort of limit on how much people want to grow the equity and how they use innovation as a skill set or a tool to achieve that and i think you know there's a couple of sort of factors that you know might make people pause obviously people are starting to worry about the tech lash or the sort of backlash against technology you know and saying this permissionless you know environment that a lot of startups have been in where you can try something and if it doesn't work you just apologize and move on or try something else versus if you think about drugs if you think about um you know things in the media if you think about financial services you often have to ask regulators for permission before you start things and i think yeah. that's the the key issue for this decade is you know if regulators or politicians and society start to say to people hey you know this all this all this innovation how much good is it actually doing to us maybe we need to limit some of it then that will naturally cap the degree of strategic interest but while we live in a sort of world of relatively open you know capital movements while we live in a world where there is a strategic imperative to grow faster than other countries and to provide higher paying jobs and the jobs of the future because change is happening then that will always be limited because people will always want to outperform on ai or genomics or the next future quantum computing in or you know meatless innovation whatever it might be in order to relatively outperform their peers and that's both individually you know you want to work in an industry that's growing you know, as well as a corporate level again you want to be in an industry and relatively outperform your industry and you're growing and there's a country you know why is it that pretty well much every country around the world is thinking about how do they support entrepreneurs and venture capital and I think this issue is actually an opportunity because I think what you're starting to see is that as people get a bit more experience and expertise you know over the past think about it, only four or five years you know we've seen this scale up that once they get a bit more experience about what works and how to make it work as an ecosystem actually this amount is only the foothill because I think the potential, if you think about the total public and private capital markets, 20 trillion plus, this amount over an entire decade is still around in there. And so I think, you know, my view is still relatively optimistic. I think there will be a shorter term backlash. We will see that affect some issues, some groups more than mm. others, some countries more than others. But overall, the competitive demands and the competitive tensions is driving more strategic capital, which can basically be more money 
if you're a government or corporation than any individual institutional investor providing it to a VC can possibly provide. So I think again, you know, I think these totals will start to turn up. It might take a year or two for that to happen, but this strategic imperative remains in place. And I think it will be an exciting place to be. Yeah, absolutely. And and a very and a very fascinating um fascinating place and uh um and realm to be in um and speaking of fascinating one of the one of the things that fascinates me about uh corporate venturing is that we really we really do see a bit of a a bit of a 80 20 pareto principle at play where a large chunk of the disclosed total corporate back deal flow can be attributed to just over 200 top investing corporates but all corporates, however frequently or infrequently investing in minority stake deals, have to think about how they how they add value. Whether it's they're adding value to their portfolio companies, adding value to their um, corporate parent, uh, or uh, adding value to society as as a whole. Um, and you know, it, it's it's important to realize that. Um, a lot of these a lot of corporates that are investing out there are still relatively young if we look at them by vintage most corporates have less than a decade of track record so learnings and further professionalization of the field which is something that we at gcv aspire to promote in the industry through through our organization these are these are crucially important things for the new for the new decade um and Jim, I think also with this slide, it's a good time to mention uh, the book that you co-wrote with uh, Heidi and Liz uh, last year. And your your book was entitled was entitled a survival a corporate venturing a survival guide. And um, I'd like to ask you, what are your your thoughts on what corporates should be doing in the next decade in order to survive and thrive? Yeah, I mean, um, well, thanks for mentioning the book. And you know, from my point of view, it's a great honor and very humbling to sort of listen and learn from Heidi and Liz, and as well as obviously the, the corporations who we interviewed and uh, who shared some of their perspectives for the book. So, you know, it was a great honor for me to, you know, kind of learn so much and, uh, you know, and, and hopefully contribute a little bit if I could as well. So, you know, it's, yeah, I think it's interesting because I think this is the key challenge. If you think about how you know, of that 80-20 as you described it, you know, of the 3,000 plus corporate venture units that have done a deal this past decade, you know, still it's, you know, it's less than 10% that really drive, you know, the majority of the deals. You know, and then if you think about, well, why is that? And you put it, you kind of answer the question to say, well, how old are they? How many groups have a 10 year plus track record? You know, and you think, well, it's less than a quarter. And so right. suddenly, I think the issue is, is in the 2020s, do we turn that effectively 80% that have less than a 10 year track record, are they able to find ways to survive, point one, and then once they survive, learn best practices, help show better financial returns as well as and or strategic returns and then do they start to expand and contribute more back to the ecosystem and that's the number one challenge because ultimately if you're an entrepreneur and you've got an investor that flakes out on you after a couple of years that hasn't been a help if you have an investor that's promised something and then they can't deliver on it that's not a help you know right. so getting the groups to understand what it takes to survive for decades and pass that institutional knowledge on to newer teams is something that the VC industry as a whole has not really done a very good job on. If you're an independent VC, there's been 2,000 VCs created in the past decade. We've gone from about 800, according to McKinsey, in 2010 to more than 2,800 you know, by the end of the near the end of the decade. You know, so all these groups have this challenge as well. Can they raise a second fund or a third fund? Are they able to retain a team? How many VCs have more than a 10 year track record that are able to survive and thrive? Even groups like Kleiner Perkins have had to renew and refresh themselves. And it's relatively few. This is a difficult business to do so. 
but how do you institutionalize that in a way that corporations can do so to create the management teams that can do so and the professional standards and the professional development and it's something that we spend a lot of time through our gcv leadership society in trying to understand who joins the industry how are they mm -hmm. retained and trained through the things like the GCV Academy, and then what do they do in order to create the conditions of success? And Heidi and Liz, obviously through their uh, consultancy Bell Mason Group, have been sort of really at the forefront of understanding the different stages and different cycles that many corporations get through, and they they very kindly share some of that in in their book. But I think it's one of the big issues that we're really going to face this decade of how do you turn the 80 percent that don't have that track record into the 80 percent that do and then potentially create an even greater flywheel effect as more corporations get confident and able to do more and create more support for the entrepreneurs and i think that's why if we can get this right as a community everyone benefits everyone corporations the CVC units, the other venture investors, and especially the entrepreneurs will benefit if we have more people with more consistency and more support and offering more value back. It's a win, win, win. And I think that's the key issue. We talked a little bit about it in the book, but this data, that 80-20 that you showed in the previous slide through to now, this understanding of the vintage is the number one takeaway, I think, for people to really get their understanding. All right, and, um, and 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 indeed, um, if um, if we look at some of the some of the um, top investors, uh, that this is a slide that uh, we kind of show every year. Uh, we try to see um, who were the top investors for the year by number of deals or by total of of dollars in in those deals, and. Uh, we always see that kind of like the usual suspects. We see uh, names like Alphabet, SoftBank, Tencent, Intel, Samsung. Um, now, like I said, we have to be careful with uh, interpreting the SoftBank dollar figure because of uh, the 9.5 bailout. But uh, it it seems to be um, the same the, the same the same kind of group uh, going back to the 80/20 uh, Pareto Pareto principle really. Um, now, moving along with with our data presentation, um, if we look at sectors and and, and subsectors, the, the this slide shows the breakdown of the corporate bag deals uh, for 2019 by sector, and we see emerging businesses from um, five major sectors have raised the largest number of of rounds. So we see IT with 600, 634. Health with uh, 400, uh, 545, excuse me, FinTech 472, business services with 464, and consumer with uh, uh, 296, uh, and also media with uh, 275. So um, now, now I, I I like to stress once again that these figures don't necessarily always coincide with the sectors that have drawn most attention. Um, in the media or raised uh, most capital always, um, but um, these figures are important to keep in mind. It's IT, health, and fintechs, the, the top three top three sectors. Um, if we look if we look at um, if we look at verticals and horizontals and how they have evolved over the past decade. In the beginning of the decade, in 2011, we see more sort of generic uh, categories like mobile, biotechnology, along with some renewables and sustainability technologies that were gaining prominence at the time. And then uh, midway through the decade, uh, we see we already beginning to see the rise of uh, things like big data, internet services, mobile tech, and uh, the Internet of Things. Um, now, of course, um, in terms of horizontals and verticals for last year, um, we see um, gaining prominence, obviously, artificial intelligence, along with things like payment tech, big data, cybersecurity, cloud computing, among among others, drawing the most interest uh, of, of corporates. Um, and before I go on with my presentation and commentary on to exits and funding initiatives, I'd like to um, 
I'd like to um, one uh, remind everyone in the audience that uh, they do have the option to send us questions. Um, there should be a panel appearing on the right hand side of your screen uh, with a question section where you could uh, type in your question and, and send it to us and Jim and I will, uh, will try to um, get to it uh, at the end of the presentation where we're going to have a Q&A. And uh, I would also like to invite Jim to use the next few slides to acquaint uh, the audience very briefly about GCV, who we are and uh, what we're trying to do. Jim? Yeah, thanks, Kalyan. I mean, certainly, um, you know, interesting to look at that sort of subsector and the change over the past decade. And I think partly what you start to see is, you know, different technologies take off and that different implication, obviously, AI coming effectively from nowhere at the start of the decade is something as people understood the impact of the sort of, you know, the sort of both the data available and the technology, the sort of chips and other processes to be able to sort of understand it and the implications, you know, healthcare remains important. You know, but about us, I think, you know, when we when I set the company up uh, 10 years ago, um, you know, I was kind of interested in two main questions. When I when I was the private equity and venture capital editor at, um, at Dow Jones, we did some trade papers and, you know, I was very much, you know, dealing with the in independent firms raising money from institutions. And I kind of had a view that, you know, that strategic place would become more important. So my starting point was who does this and what do they do? That's what we do at Global Corporate Venturing. And the other publications we do, such as Global University Venturing and Global Impact Venturing, which is more of a government focus around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, you know, kind of taking that same approach is once you understand and get the data and talk to the people involved, you can get a better sense of how the overall innovation capital ecosystem fits together. You know, how do they work with VCs? How do they work with entrepreneurs? How does this all fit together, hopefully to make a, a better whole? You know, there's a, a great quote from David Hume, which is, uh, you know, truth springs from argument among good friends. You, you don't always get VCs agreeing with corporates or vice versa, or let alone with governments and angels and, you know, philanthropic impact investors. But actually together, you know, you can get some idea of, uh, of a better truth out there. And so that's what we try to do with the Connect platform. The Leadership Society brings together the ecosystem. We do some conferences and events to do so. You know, the, the communication, the information is shared you know, so that you can look at the data and read the stories online through globalcorporateventuring.com. You know, the Academy helps provide some training and understands the analytics, hopefully helps us understand more what's going on. But the Leadership Society and the Connect platform enables the corporations to talk to each other, not just at the events, but through an online messaging platform and use the, the AI that we have, the algorithm, to hopefully connect up people so they can swap portfolio companies and allow that better connections to happen. So, you know, we've been very honored to work with a great set of partners to do it. So, you know, for analytics, obviously, Cubix, you know, software firm in Silicon Valley being instrumental. You know, for what we try to do on the editorial piece uh, for the next slide, you know, we do sort of a different sector in a different region each month in the magazine, but we also do a number of special reports, such as at our GCVI summit next week, we've got a rising stars uh, and emerging leaders report. We also do the annual report, which we call World of Corporate Venture. You know, we do different sectors, oil and gas. We'll be doing reports looking at AI, healthcare, specialist regions such as Asia, you know, and pulling all of this together to hopefully provide greater understanding for the specific communities around the world in different sectors and at different stages of development. That's our goal, really. Next slide. You know, the events that we do, obviously, the California one next week's our largest, 800 people. It's uh, be a sellout, probably sell out of the weekend, as I haven't looking at the numbers. It'll be about $10 trillion of aggregate annual revenue from the corporates who attend. It's about 200 billion of venture assets under management. We do our sort of London conference will be our 10th one there in June 3rd or 4th. And, uh, and then we do other ones in Israel, 11th of February, you know, Synergize in New York, Energy in Houston. Our Latin America one is down in Brazil in October, Apex Brazil uh, hosting, leading on that. And then a number of sort of smaller, more network orientated events, which we call connect meetups in different cities, such as one you're leading, I think, with our Easy Business School in Barcelona, Kalia. Yeah, on uh, February 27th, actually, the last day of uh, Mobile World Congress. That's so if anyone, uh, if 
anyone is in Barcelona, um, feel free um, to sign up for, for the networking cocktail. Perfect. Yeah, so as I say, um, Kelly, I'm delighted that you uh, sort of lead the sort of GCV analytics. We really appreciate the support that Jeff and Tim at Cubix Analytics have been able to offer over the years to enable us to understand and, and use the software to visualize and showcase this data. And for more information, obviously, get in touch with either Kelly and myself or anyone else within the GCV team. But you can get a hold of us at info at global or anything else. And back to you, Kelly, what's, uh, what's next? Um, up next, exits. Um, so, as uh, as people who follow us know, we we also try to track uh, exit transactions evol uh, involving corporate investors, whether whether as exiting or uh, sometimes as acquirers. So, in 2019, we saw 274 exits uh, globally uh, for corporates. Uh, and those included 200 acquisitions, 64 IPOs, and 10, 10 other transactions. Most of them, uh, 186, uh, were in US-based uh, US companies. And if we look at um, if we look at the picture on a year-on-year -year basis, uh, we see that the 206, just 274, excuse me, uh, represents uh, about 20% increase over the previous year's level at. Uh, 2029. Um, the U.S. hosted about two thirds of those of those transactions, if we if we really think about it, with 186. Um, there were also, you know, notable ones hosted in China and in India and uh, in Israel. The uh, total estimated capital involved in exits uh, stood at 56.1 uh, billion, a notable 37% decrease from the 84. 88.3 billion registered in, uh, registered in 2018. Um, so most of the most of the top exits for for 20, 20, 2019 were acquisitions, as I already mentioned. Um, even, even though the year will, will be remembered more for some of the uh, high profile um, IPOs or even some IPOs that never never took place. Um, on the next slide, um, here I've summarized some of the top exits um, for last year. So I'm not going to talk about Uber or, or Lyft or the Kareem acquisition that we we already mentioned, uh, but I'd like to I'd like to mention some of uh, some of the other ones which were also quite significant in size, but nowhere nearly as publicized in media outlets as, as as they probably should have been uh, we saw how delivery hero uh, acquired uh, Woolwa brothers in uh, in south korea which is one of its uh, local peers of uh, in terms of the, in terms of food delivery allowing internet companies neighbor and cyber agent to exit um, intel acquired uh, one of its portfolio companies uh, which is a, an Israel-based uh, deep learning uh, tech provider, Habana Labs, here for two billion. Um, we also saw Alphabet uh, paying two point, agreeing to pay two point six billion to acquire Lucre, which is uh, also one of its portfolio companies because it was backed by Capital G in the past, among among a host of uh, of other investors, as you can see here. Um, we. We even had some other notable IPOs, such as Pinterest IPO, which was, you know, nowhere nearly as publicized as uh, Uber or Lyfts. Um, even in terms of acquisitions, we saw um, Edgewell Personal Care acquire um, Harry's for 1.37 billion. So, so the point of the point that I'm trying to get across with this slide is uh, there were quite a few uh, exit transactions of. Uh, of pretty big size last year that were nowhere nearly um, as as famous or as publicized in the media as they probably should have been. So with that in mind, going on to uh, funding initiatives, um, and as, as people who follow GCV know, we also try to track funding initiatives involving corporates. Um, including newly launched CVC units, uh, venture funds with corporate LPs, corporate-backed accelerators and incubators, and, and and other such initiatives. So, in twenty in twenty nineteen, we tracked three hundred and two of those initiatives, as uh, as this graph clearly shows. And 
um, it, uh, they, they included 198 venture funds with corporate LPs, 58 uh, venturing units, most of them newly launched, some of them uh, recapitalized, uh, 29 corporate-backed accelerators, nine incubators, and eight other initiatives. And most of these initiatives, as you can see, were set up in uh, Asia, 127 of them, North America, 89, and Europe, um, 55. The countries that hosted the largest number of such initiatives were the US, Japan, China, Singapore, and the UK, despite fears over Brexit. Here, I, I should say, um, if if we look at the dollar dollar figures uh, in such initiatives, we we do see that uh, for 2019 it stood at about uh, at just north of uh, 41 billion dollars. Um, which makes it significantly higher versus uh, the figure for the previous year, which uh, which was about 30.8 uh, billion. Uh, but this was largely due to the effect of one uh, particularly big fund called TA13, which was sized at 8.5 billion, um, but it received a really, really modest um, corporate contribution of about 20 million from insurance from Taiwan Life. So um, I have not even um, placed it on the uh, top list for that very reason, because the, the contribution is, is rather rather minuscule for, for its size. Um, the top funding initiatives we reported, um, obviously range in scope uh, of their targeted sectors from consumer and health through transport and logistics to IT and telecom. So it was not, there was not a single particular concentration for, for a given sector, I'd say. In terms of the regional distribution, well, in this case, it was North America that accounted uh, for about 41, um, 41%, uh, 41% and uh, it was about $17 billion raised of the total. And if we look at the ranking of top funding initiatives from from last year um we did see quite a few uh, quite a few interesting funds so um we did see the two billion soft bank innovation fund targeting um latin america um we did see the well the attempted uh, second vision fund um whose fundraising seems to have hit a bit of a roadblock after uh, the we work fallout um, it targeted originally 108 billion, but uh, that target number may have to be drastically revised uh, downward. So, um, according to the latest reports, uh, there have actually only been about two billion uh, raised and put in the coffers. That's as of uh, as of December, as of last month. Um, and you know, as in as in uh, as in with exits, there were there were plenty of other funds uh, and funding initiatives that uh, do deserve some sort of mention. In in China, we saw an unnamed right hailing focused fund uh, sized at 1.46 billion um, that was raised and backed by both Alibaba and Tencent. So that was that's quite significant. Uh, Allianz, um, its venturing unit got recapitalized now has over one billion uh, in uh, in, in capital, um, because of because of its uh, its its performance, uh, the healthcare industrial fund uh, by AstraZeneca and um, China International Capital Corporation, um, despite all the trade tensions between China and the U.S., we we did see this. Um, some of the other ones like Hana Hana Ventures, which uh, now has uh, nearly 900 million, um, for which is big for a South Korean. Uh, South Korean corporate. Um, then we had uh, Ping An, the, the Ping An Consumer Tech Fund uh, with 786 million, and we do see we have been seeing a bit of a, a bit of a trend, actually, in terms of corporates uh, trying to start funds and uh, raising capitals from other other LPs. Uh, so. Jim, what are, what are your thoughts on 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 this trend actually? Because it's something that we've been we've been definitely seeing. Yeah, great point, Kalyan, and fascinating to look at the data. You know that sort of returns, exits point of view, how it matches up with the capital in, 
but then the sort of funding initiatives i think is is that future piece and we're seeing what we call sort of that hybrid model where corporations aren't just usually having one group uh, they're also thinking about different strategies so they might have something which is a bit more strategic to their funding but they might also as they get a more of a track record and show the returns inviting either other strategic investors or other financial investors to kind of leverage that sort of fund size and enable them to do more and i think that's creating sort of two things you know as more groups have more of the track record they can do it softbank obviously did so with its vision fund using the sort of track record it had through alibaba and other of its deals you know but we're seeing others do it you know swisscom you know a, a kind of switzerland based telecoms operator you know took in financial money you know <laughs> we've seen deutsche telecom over in germany a similar phone operator think about strategic investors from asia being able to join together the program and as you look around we're seeing more of those either corporations committing more to independent venture capital firms and you know getting some relationships there perhaps more of a financial focus with strategic benefits or more strategic and potentially bringing in other financial benefits and we're seeing a whole host of different models that opening up is really creating that scalable opportunities. And I think it's also creating something that uh, Basil Darwish, who um, has just asked the question about where he says, curious about your views, whether there'd been an evolution of staffing of CVCs over the past decade. And I think, you know, that question that he's just asked plays into this in terms of the funding initiatives. Because someone like Basil, who moved from City, you know, to Wells Fargo to help develop its strategic <laughs> venture investments group, you know, Wells Fargo had had a great track record for 20 plus years as the LP, primary LP in in Norwest, more of an independent run, financially focused group. But they again, they want to complement that with something with perhaps a little bit more of a fintech and, and sort of strategic focus. So they hired um, Basil. And I think we're seeing more of that corporate venturing groups maybe 10 years ago, you know, have perhaps a little bit more of a focus of using some internal staff people you know to set up a unit who knew the corporation think about some deals that might be close to the core you know and then they would kind of dabble their toe in you know in maybe external fund commitments and over the past decade i think they've got more sophisticated about hiring people with experience you know someone like basil fantastic track record and understanding payments and you know the broader global ecosystem that's happening there you know allying that with someone usually you know core leaders who understand the corporate well and then perhaps bringing in some entrepreneurs eh, as well you know so they're bringing that sort of best of vc experience probably those who have done corporate venturing before allying it to people who understand the parent company and those who can talk to the entrepreneurs and strike the deals and then the corporations are being much more thoughtful about the diversity inclusion if you look at the past 30 years of independent venture capital you know staffing some a nice paper came out of harvard a couple of years ago by paul gompers who looked at you know basically a three percentage point increase in female vcs and female led entrepreneurs in that time scale to about 10 percent so 10 percent of the global venture ecosystem had a female you know were female now, corporate venture is about it's about a quarter or so, according to our latest survey, latest information. We'll come to that a little bit more. Yeah, just, a bit, that, and just a bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I don't want to preempt that too much. But I think the funding initiatives, you know, are a reflection of the sophistication and depth of experience that corporate venture and units have. And that's because they're able to attract the right people. And I think the funding initiatives and then enable because again, more of them have this track record that they can show that they can deliver the returns, encourages more people which you gain leverage. And it's I think it's just this amazing sort of inflection point that we're at. I'm super excited by it. So great question, Basil, and a great sort of chart there. Carry on. Onwards, onwards. All right. Um well, actually, the last the last few uh, few slides that I've prepared um, before we finish and open the uh, Q and A session, I really wanted to give our audience a bit of a teaser with some select data points, which I think are very interesting from our latest survey, um, and which um, come uh, which come to come as really really pertinent uh, to our goal of promoting more professionalism and and learning. Uh, learning in the community back to the point that uh, we already touched on um, 
and of, of course though they will be able to reach uh, all the results of our survey in the uh, world of corporate our upcoming world of corporate venturing report which will be released uh, next week um just um just in time for the monterey um innovation summit um so one of the one of one of the things one of the most fascinating things about venture capital is that it's inherently a very risky business some call it and uh rightly so the riskiest asset class and you know if if we think about the traditional it's the best return in asset class if done well over the longest period right. of time right yeah. right that might if, be a factor of its risk though as well. <laughs> right um so if, if we if we think about the traditional uh, capital asset pricing model higher risks are supposed to go hand in hand with higher returns right mm -hmm. um wh wh whether that's always the case in reality it's, it's a different story but um, you know, one of the things we asked our, uh, the CVCs responding to our survey was about their net uh, IRR, and um, these are the results that we that we got. Um, so nearly two thirds, 64% uh, of respondents said their their net IRR stood at above 11%, which I think is quite quite significant. Only 5% said they had a negative IRR. So um, this this does suggest, even though there is a bit of a a bit of a bias here in the self-reporting, as in any self-reporting survey, um, this does suggest that uh, over the last the last decade, CVCs on average have done it um, fairly well um, in terms of their financial performance. Um, whether the financial performance uh, is uh, is a consideration. Uh, along with uh, strategic returns or not. Um, another way to look at this is to ask about the percentage of failed investments as failure in a number of businesses in your portfolio is inevitable in venture capital and that's exactly what we did. Um, so 69% uh, say um, that only 30% or less of their portfolio companies fail to return the capital, capital invested. Um, again, this is a self-reported figure, so there's inevitably some bias and overestimation in it, but it's still quite significant to consider. Um, another interesting aspect for, which is something very interesting for any professional field, is the issue of compensation. And even though we did ask the survey participants about uh, executive and MD compensation, I thought this particular question was more interesting, as um, I often hear many people lament that talent retention is a big problem for CVCs. So according to this graph, as you can see, nearly half of corporates have no additional incentives for employees, 47%. Um, 30% um, use corporate stock as an additional incentive, and only 20% of them have uh, things like uh, carried interest or carry, or a combination of carry and uh, and stock or uh, something something similar. So I think this is an interesting point to to reflect on for for everyone in the industry in terms of uh, incentivizing uh, talent. And finally. Um, as we at GCV are keen to promote diversity and, and inclusion across the industry through our leadership society, through other initiatives, um, I decided to also um, give this, uh, this slide on gender ratios. Um, even though the graph clearly shows the gender distribution is still fairly uneven with 53% 53, 53%, uh, of people on teams being majority uh, male, we do see 30% said that they had a relatively even number of uh, males and females on the team. And while this is not sufficient, it's certainly a good thing and a, and a considerable improvement over results that we've seen in previous years. And if we look at um, the previous year, the 2018 survey, um, we see that only 20% said relatively even. So that being said, it's a considerable improvement. Uh, still more to improve on um but very positive so on this optimistic and positive note i conclude my presentation jim we could uh, open for a q a perhaps if people have submitted questions or um 
discuss a few things um, among the two of us. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we get some questions coming through. I'll just sort of pick up on that point around the gender ratio. So there's some interesting work done through the GCV Leadership Society as we transition from Wendell Brooks, who's head of uh, Intel Capital, to Young Sun, who's president of Samson. Um, he, for the next two-year period, at next week, as it happens, uh, so we're delighted by that. But that sort of diversity and inclusion, you know, has been a sort of core theme that's been running through the past couple of years under Wendell. You know, we did a sort of a report that Samsung and Intel and others contributed to to think about the questions and what the KPIs would be. You know, and it's really interesting to see how thoughtful many of the corporations have. They've got very big HR departments as a starting point, you know, which always helps. But, um, you know, but I think it's a it's an interesting sort of opportunity set to think through, as Basil asked around, who's coming into the industry? How is it retained? What is the, the compensation? You know, what does that mean for the types of deals done and you know, how much is put out? You know, and I, I think there's increasing evidence to, that kind of that 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 is available to look at that type of issues. So, you know, uh, Marcelino Ford uh, is also asking a question on this issue around data on ethnic or racial diversity. So, you know, it's an interesting question, Marcelino. Um, you know, so one way that we look at sort of ethnicity, or, you know, is Obviously, it's a global industry. So if you just take, you know, how many are say American, you know, that will be a snapshot versus how many are Japanese. But you know, one of the questions that comes out, you, you know, if you think about it, is if you're a Japanese headquartered company, what proportion of your CVC team, you know, are non-Japanese, for example? you know, either based in Japan or based elsewhere. And again, I think, you know, in saying, you know, if you're a US headquartered company, you know, what percentage of your team, you know, are either based outside the US or non-American, you know, uh, or inside the US and non-American within that role, or, you know, whatever different factors. And again, you know, corporate ventures seem to do better than VCs, not necessarily perfectly. You know, it's hard to think about perfection in, you know, in, in many ways on this topic, but being thoughtful and mindful on it is one of the issues. So in terms of pure specific data, um, it's quite a difficult one for us to really sort of get more of a handle on. We do look indeed. at the heads of the units. Um, sorry, can you? No, yeah, indeed. I, I was uh, just going to say that indeed, it's a very, very difficult sort of data point to, um, to, to try to get. Uh, and it's, um, I would say mostly it's because of the sort of sensitivity that this sort of question on ethnicity or race uh, yeah. um, comes along with so yeah. um, it's, that's part of part of really the problem of uh, of researching that yeah yeah exactly i mean certainly when we look at say you know rising stars emerging leaders who's selected by the heads of units or the powerless the overall heads of units out of the sort of you know near three thousand that we sort of track and follow you know it feels like when you add in, you know, let's say Hitachi is run by a German, you know, their corporate venture in unit, you know, if you think about a whole host of different groups, you know, they're either female or sort of diversity. And I think in many ways, corporations are extra mindful of this because part of what they want to do is, you know, is try and reflect a, a wider group. Uh, or wider constituencies and they have to be mindful of who's going out and representing them and how they think about it and you know Samsung and a whole host of others you know really sort of talk to that type of you know type to that issue so um so great question we'd love to get your help and support on it and understand more from your perspective and what more we could be doing as a as an industry but uh I'll, i think we're coming to the top of the hour so i'll hand back to Kalyan to 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 close up and uh, you know think about the next webinar and the next stage but i think we'll be catching up with everyone and uh, next week as well so thanks from my mm -hmm. point of view and Kalyan, thanks for all the data and hard work that's gone into this yeah, um, privileged to do that, Jim. Um, thank, uh, thanks everyone for attending this uh, this webinar uh, live. Uh, we'll be catching up with uh, many of you next week uh, in Monterey, California. Um, stay tuned for our our next webinar in February, which uh, we haven't decided uh, a date for on. 
yet uh, but uh, you will be um, hearing about it um, pretty soon so uh, thank you very much and um, have a wonderful um, day afternoon uh, evening or morning wherever you might be in the world bye bye